Jesus. Hebrews chapter 13, we're going to read verse 5. And let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man will do unto me. Father God, I thank you, Lord, that if you God are for us, then who could be against us? Father, I thank you tonight for your faithfulness, God. I thank you, Lord, that you are a holy God, that you are a just God, a righteous God, a faithful God tonight, Father. Lord, I just thank you for every person in this place, God. I ask you, God, that you would have your way in our lives, God. God, we just thank you, Lord, that you, who you love, you chasten, Father God. So, Lord, we open up our hearts to you, Father God. Lord, we ask you tonight, God, that you would just have your way, God. Lord, all those things that don't belong in our hearts and all those things that don't belong in our lives and everything, God, that keeps us from growing in you, Lord, remove those things, Lord God. Let our flesh die, God, so that our spirit might live, God so that our lives are transformed, God, that we can go into the land and possess that which you have given your life for us to have, Father. Lord, give us ears to hear and eyes to see what the Spirit is saying. And Lord, let your word go forth tonight and let it not return unto you void. But God, let it accomplish that for which you have sent it. Let it renew the mind, God, so that our lives might be transformed, God. Lord, that we might be the church that you have called us to be, Father. I thank you for your grace and your strength, Lord God. Because it gives us the ability to overcome everything, Lord God. Not just a few things, Lord God, but everything. Because you have created us to be more than conquerors. We praise you and we thank you. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. <coughs> well, hallelujah. I am extremely um, thankful uh, to be here tonight. Had rather a busy weekend um, after I left you on Tuesday. Friday, I was in Harvey Cedar's. Jersey, never even heard of that place. Um, absolutely beautiful place, was on the water. We had a singles conference. I was hanging out with Paul Paoli. And um, believe it or not, all the years that I know Paul, I have never gotten to see him in concert. Can you believe that? I guess because every time I came, it was either sold out or I was traveling or I was busy. So it was really great to uh, be able to hang with the P Paoli boys as I endearingly call them. Um, we had a wonderful time, and then from there, I drove over to Lindenwall, New Jersey, where I've been at a conference, and I had a class to teach on Monday. I had two classes to teach today, and I came here, and I'm going back tonight, because I got another class to, um, to teach. And I, and, I just, and, I, and I say all that, because when, when people were asking me where I was going today, I said, I'm going home, going to my favorite place. Um, I love going out, I love preaching, but this is my home. And you be my peoples, and um, and I just and I just love you so much, and um, I just thank God for having you in my life and, and all that you, you know that you mean to me. And really, um, as much as I love to get out and and do what God has called me to do, I know that God has called me to do something here. And you are precious to me, and you are worth the drive. But you can pray tonight uh, that there is no traffic on my way back. Amen that I can just hit the road running and, um, and go there. So I appreciate your, um, your prayers for me. And I also realize why um, God is going to allow my son to be a, a pilot. So um, now we can just start to pray that, you know, with the license will come my own plane and all that, and I could just kind of jet set and stop and go and, 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 and not have to get tired and sit in traffic. Amen. So we started a new series last week from Sabotage to Entourage, and it was a passionate message last week, came from the very core of my being, but I am so excited because everything that we spoke about on the retreat, everything that I've been, I've been speaking about, I've been hearing um, speakers on, on, on a national level confirming. I mean, it, it would be, if you, if you heard what they were saying you would have thought she listened to them and got that. I mean, word for word. The message last night was all about Ezekiel in, in the valley of the shadow of death. And, and everybody in, in the body of Christ. And that's what I, I thank God about God's word. That it's never just a private word. 
When God wants to say something and God is getting ready to do something within his people, it's not just one little corner. Not just one little church has all the answers, but it's God's church. And when God wants his word to go forth, it will go forth. And 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 there's just there's just a whole consensus of um, from, from every preacher, from every prophet, from every bishop, that God is getting ready to do something like that we have never in our lives have ever seen. And, and with that, um, there, there comes great accountability. Great accountability. And we've got to prepare our hearts and our minds and our lives. And just, you know, forget all that stuff that doesn't matter. It's time that we just reprioritize our life and just get our eyes focused on the Lord and what he has at hand and get ourselves ready and ask God. You know, I, I love that, 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 that little chorus, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Uh, it's one of my favorite choruses my whole life. Because, Lord, let me be that sanctuary. Let me, let me, you know, when you put me in the fire, I want to come out tried and tested and coming out proven that, that my heart was, was real towards you. And God put this series on my heart from sabotage to entourage. And, you know, it's, it's never really <coughs> in our struggle that we, that we fail and we make the biggest mistakes. Because it, it seems human nature is that when we're in trouble or we're, we're going through a difficult time, we tend to be a little bit more on the side of looking for God. Because we want to hear, like, what, what are you saying, God? And, and we're looking for him to do something. And sometimes um, it's, it's not in, in, in the trial that we make the mistake, although, you know, we do make mistakes. But sometimes it's when we start feeling a little bit victorious and we start to, you know, come into um, what, what God has or, or sometimes the pressure is a little bit lifted and we can end up sabotaging what God is doing because um, we're, not, we're not careful in unguarded moments. You know, we, we've got to be careful in unguarded moments when we're not quite um, looking where we're going, you know, have you ever, like you see those, those YouTube, um, films, you know, where you see the woman she's texting and she's looking down at her phone and while she's texting, she'll walk into, you know, the fountain and she fell into it. It was a couple of years ago. And sometimes if we're not, if we're not looking where we're going, if we're not aware that there is an enemy who is seeking whom we may devour, we can very easily, um, sabotage ourselves and keep us from the very things of God. Um, and I, and I noticed this weekend at being at the, at the singles event, um, you know, I was only, I was only asked to do, you know, three sessions, Friday night, Saturday morning and, and Sunday morning. And, and some of the people, um, came up to me and they said, you know, we want a Q and a, we want to ask you questions. And I said, well, you can ask me right now. And I'll, and, but they wanted something formal. So Sunday after I preached, um, and, I, and I'm always a little nervous when I open up the floor for questions because you really kind of never know um, what's going to come at you and why it's coming at you. And I got to tell you something. Um, uh, I got hit with some really difficult questions and some very controversial subjects. And it just kind of confirmed this word that God had spoken in my heart, um, that compromise is the beginning of demise. And, you know, you, you don't have to look very far and, and on the news. You know, we really do see that we are living in Matthew 24 right now. Um, and, and, and you can see where sometimes good intentions and, and compassion can sometimes blur the lines. It's easy when something's black and something's white, but when all of a sudden, when people put like a worldly spin on it, all of a sudden things can get a little bit shaded because we don't know how to handle things. We don't know how to um, be the people of God that he's called us to be. And yet, you know, there's a fine line between I don't, I don't compromise my walk. I, I don't compromise what the world has said. I mean, what God has said with what the world wants us to do. 
But on the other hand, you know, the Bible says that they'll know we're Christians by our love. And unfortunately, um, because I don't think that we have the words or we haven't said things appropriately, that people are knowing Christians by their hate rather than their love. But in the meantime, you can't, you can't compromise certain things. And so the Bible is very clear that we need to stay away from the very um, appearance of evil. And we need to understand that there is definitely going to be opposition to our mission. There's always going to, there's going to be that enemy that is going to try to trip you up in your life. That somehow he won't get you, to, and he doesn't get you to blatantly do something. Because we're very good at recognizing black and white. It's when things become gray. That sometimes we can get very confused and we can end up making mistakes. Um, but I want to assure you tonight that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And God, in his grace, has given us grace and has made a way out of every bit of temptation that you and I might have come into. I mean, don't think because you're a Christian that you're not going to be tempted. Because that's not going to happen. Jesus was tempted. If Jesus was tempted, everything that Jesus experienced, we are going to experience ourselves. And sometimes one of the biggest ways that the enemy gets us to falter is this thing called compromise. And compromise will do nothing but lead you to your demise. And the thing about compromise is compromise is sometimes in the gray area. And, and, and sometimes, you know, and, and I started saying this last week, but you know, when you look at over the decades, and if I start in the 50s, remember Elvis? I mean, before that, you know, you, um, you had all kinds of, everybody was, you know, uh, prim and proper. Everybody was dressed up to their neck. Every, nobody moved when they sang. They, everything was so wholesome. And then all of a sudden, Elvis comes on the scene. And when Elvis comes on the scene and he's, and he's gyrating, and, and, he, and I say gyrating, um, that's what they called it back then. But he was just, you know, shaking his legs. And people were horrified. And they called it the devil's music. And then now, as, as time has gone, we've gotten so used to that. And, and things have slipped, and, and sl it, but slowly. Slowly, because after Elvis, you know, then it then it was the Beatles, and then it was then it was this, and then it was in the eighties. It was, you know, it, it was um, it was Madonna and and all and all her antics, and and now I I mean it, it's like if you listen to secular music, it is um I mean it is amazing how far things have gotten so out of hand that there I mean you're more surprised when something is wholesome. Even country music, country music was always a great um, alternative because it was always about God and country. And, and sometimes you watch those videos and their lyrics might say one thing, but their videos are showing something completely different. And, and what happens is, is when you hang out with, with sin enough, you get immune to it. You get used to it. And, and God, God really showed me this example one time. God had, had led me to go on a 40-day fast. And it was not a 40-day fast from food, but it was a 40-day fast <coughs> from television. Now, I'll be honest, I like, I like movies like courtroom scenes, um, Law and Order. I love mysteries. I love documentaries. I, I, I love that stuff. I love the whodunit and, you know, get the bad guy and, and all of that. And, and, you know, you would watch these things and, and nothing, you don't think anything is affecting you. But when I was, I wouldn't watch television for 40 days. And, and, and that's, that's a long time. 40 days to do anything. It's a long time. And when I, when I stayed away from the television for 40 days, and then when my 40 days was up, I went back. And some of the same episodes that I watched before that I really it didn't affect me, I was horrified because I was like, what in the world are you watching? Because I saw murder and I saw death. And I, 
And because what I did was I took out that worldliness out of, out of, out of my atmosphere. And while I wasn't fixing my eyes on, on worldly stuff, all of a sudden, the Spirit of God just kept coming in and coming in. And then I realized that when I turned the television on, what a violation it was to my spirit. But it had never really bothered me before. Why? Because I was desensitizing myself to it. You know, kids today, they're listening to music. Uh, and I mean the sexual connotations and the lyrics and the cursing. It, it, is, it, it is so horrible, but they're so, they're so used to it that they don't even realize that it's not even appropriate stuff to even play. They shouldn't be listened to it, but sometimes this is our music, and they will turn it on. And it's, you know, I mean, back, back in the day, you know, parents got angry because people were, were listening to Elvis. Now it's like, I'll go buy you a CD of Elvis. You know, I mean, that's, that's healthy, that's good, that's good music. But... The problem is, is that society has gone so far the other way, and we've just become so desensitized to it. Even, even commercials. In the 1950s, you never saw a woman in a bra. Now, I mean, they, they have exposed... I mean, to see a woman, she's, she's fully dressed. Okay, when, when now they're showing underwear, they're showing Victoria's Secret. I mean, it's like anything goes today. Even, even the commercials about, about different, you know, sexual stuff. I mean, it is, it is amazing how violated every single day we are and we are allowing the spirit of the world to come in and we don't even realize that it's affecting us and it's affecting our spirit and what's, what's inside of us because we've become desensitized. Now, nobody here meant to do it. It's just out there, and we don't realize that it's happening. And listen, I am not trying to put a legalistic spirit on you and try to tell you that you can't do this and you can't do that. I'm, I'm not saying that, but I am saying that we need to be aware of who we are and how we walk and how we talk. People are looking at us. And, and, and if we, um, and if we're not living right, I mean, they, they've got to know the difference. When people look at our lives, they've got to see a difference. They've got to be able to see Jesus in us, because if they don't see Jesus in us, how are they going to come to know him? So there's got to be a difference. There's got to be a difference the way we talk and the way we walk. And I'm not saying walk around with your nose up in the air and hold a Bible and beat everybody and got to preach to everybody and point out to everybody what they're doing wrong. Listen, if everybody would just take their finger and point it on the inside to themselves and live under what God's word says, we wouldn't be as, uh, as close to sin as, as we are. God is the God of truth. Satan is the father of lies and confusion. Sin will always look good, but eventually it will kill you. And, and here's the thing. We cannot have our cake and eat it too. God says, be ye holy as I am holy. And if we are praying, see, this is why sometimes we get we sabotage ourselves because we pray, oh God, you know, less of me and more of you. And I believe that in one sense we we believe that with our heart and we do want it, but yet we don't want to give up those things in our life that are blocking us from walking in the things in, in, in God. Is this okay? Okay. So and and we're not the only ones who have compromised. There's people in the Bible that did this. Um, Adam, Adam and Eve, when they ate the, ate the apple, ate the Bible, ate the apple, um, Lot and his wife uh, in Sodom, and you can write this scripture down and go home and study it. In Genesis 13, 12 and 13, we see that Lot and his family, they are living outside the city gates of Sodom. They're living outside the gates. So they're not in it, but they're just around it. And when they're around it, they get used to it. And a lot of times we think, you know what? I can handle it. I'm a grown adult. I, I can be around this stuff, and it's not going to affect me. 
But when the wicked mob comes and takes the angel, and, and the angel, you know, it says, brethren, some translations, Lot is saying to the people, he calls them friends. And every indication, friends means a relationship. So he was living outside the city. He wasn't, he wasn't doing anything with them. But all of a sudden, he's with them, living with them long enough that now he's in the city. And he's calling these people friends. Because he developed a relationship with them. And he got immune. He got desensitized from how they were living. He was flirting with evil instead of commanding it to go. And sometimes what we do and not even realize it, we flirt with evil. When Jesus said, stay away from even the appearance of it. Even if it's not sin, if it looks like sin, if you have to explain why you're doing something. And here's a rule to live by. If you can't do it in front of Jesus and you can't do it in front of your mama, you shouldn't be doing it. And I've always taught my kids that. Well, is this right? Is this right? I said, listen, if you feel uncomfortable doing it, if Jesus was at that party, would Jesus go to that party? Can I go to that party? I know you don't want me to go. But if I went to that party, would I be upset with what was going on at that party? Because if you can't do it in front of Jesus, I mean, that's why when you come into church, if you can't do it in church, you shouldn't do it. Because Jesus living with Jesus, it's an open book. Jesus doesn't live in secrets. Jesus doesn't have to hide anything. In fact, Jesus, what he did was he called everything out. Because Jesus is the light. Light and darkness don't, um, they they don't mix. In fact, Lot goes so bad that in verse 8, he's willing to get, he's willing to have these, these people assault his own daughters. In verse 16, he hesitates to leave the wicked city, and the angels had to pull him out before it was destroyed. That's how comfortable Lot got in an ungodly place. And you read that story of Sodom and Gomorrah, but that's what happened. It didn't happen right away. And this is not to put anything on anybody, but sometimes we do stuff and we don't realize and we wonder why our prayers are not effective, why we are not living and walking in all that Christ has, because God doesn't compromise. He is a God of truth. God sets his holy standard. And when he sets his standard, he doesn't expect you and I to keep that on our own. That's why he bled and he he gave his son for us, that through his grace, that we can resist the devil. We can resist the temptation. But when you get so close to sin, you know, in the book of Haggai, it says that that holiness is not contagious. You would think that it is, but it's not. Because sin will rub off on you faster than holiness will rub off on somebody else. I know it's hard to swallow, but that's the truth. Because what happens, you become desensitized. And the moment that he started going into the city and he started to allow their influence on them. See, greater is he that is in me. God has called you and I, we are more than conquerors. We have the word of God. We have the light in our life. And we've got to be able to trust and rely on God that, you know, listen, I don't care what anybody else is doing. God, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow your word. Look at Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. They didn't do the right thing with the money. They lied and they died. They lied and they died. You lie, you fry. That's the way it goes. Because it why? Because Satan is the father of lies. And sometimes we, we flirt with evil. We think, well, it's just a little white lie. It's okay. I left. My husband is like incapable of, of lying. About 10 years ago, um, somebody had called me, and I was just in one of those moods. I didn't feel like talking to them. And I said to him, tell him I'm not home. 
and I hear him on the phone, and he's going, uh, uh, uh well, uh, she, uh, she, she's, she's not, she's not, she's not home. I'm so sorry. No, she is home. She just doesn't feel like talking right now. And I'm like, Bob, <laughs> Bob, you threw me under the bus. What's wrong with you? But in his heart, it was a lie. Now, thank God I live with a man. If he can't lie, he can't, if he can't lie about that, he can't lie about big stuff, amen? So I, th I thank God for the integrity and, 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 and what he, you know, and the man of God that he is and, and the conviction of his spirit. But he, he doesn't do that because there's no, there's no compromise because to God, there's no difference between an out and out big lie or, or a white lie. So, you know, God is a God of truth. Achan in the book of Joshua. Listen, it was Achan's sin. But in order for him to do what he did, he, you know, he had those stolen goods. He, he kept the spoils of the war. And now he kept it. But guess what? There were people all around that were keeping his secret. They all compromised. And sometimes we think we're doing a good thing. But if it goes against the word of God, we can't do it. Look at David. The first day that he got himself out of position, that he wasn't where he needed to be, it was the day that the kings go out to war. The first day he decides, you know what? I don't feel like being where I need to be. And he steps out of God's order of protection. And there, Satan, Satan's got the trap set up. And David compromised just a little bit. I have a headache. I don't feel like going to war. Let somebody else fight. I've been fighting my... And he might have had a million good reasons why he didn't want to go out. I mean, really, who wants to go to war anyway? But whether he wanted to go or not go, that's where God had sent them because that was the day. He was king. He needed to be there. And that's why, you know, sometimes we, 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 it's not about being legalistic, but God puts borders and boundaries around us. Remember, we are peculiar people. That means we are like a dot in the middle of a circle. We are in the hedge of God. And when we start to flirt with evil, when we step out of the hedge of God, we've stepped out of his divine protection. Because here's the thing, Satan cannot penetrate the hedge. There is a do not enter sign around the hedge. But if we willingly step out, Satan turns around and says, huh, she's on my playing field now. The OBI story. Everybody knows that story. But I'll tell you what. My father looked at me, he says, listen, and it was, it was an important lesson that I've kept with me my whole life, and I never did it again. He said, you stepped out of God's protection. You stepped out of where God has you. And when you do that, Satan is allowed to say, she's here. I didn't make her do this. She's here, and now I get to attack. So we have to think. Because here's the thing about sin. When you begin to flirt with sin, one thing sin will do, it will make you stupid. Sin makes us stupid. Because when you sin, it's like, did you, did you ever hear the, the, the crime stories and all that? The, 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 the thief or, or the, the person who committed the crime will always re go back to the scene of the crime. They'll always do something to mess something up, to, to leave a clue. Why? Because it's sin. And sin makes you stupid. It takes you out of the God mind and into your own mind. It's how Satan begins to mess with your head. You remember the prodigal son. He wanted his own way, and his father had to let him go, and he had to learn a hard lesson a hard way. Romans 1.28 tells us that if we continue and not, and, and not repent, you know, to continue in our, in our evil ways and not repent, what happens? God, God turns around, and he turns us over to a reprobate mind. 
that's a scary, you know, but this stuff, we can't, you can't jump, you got to preach a full gospel, people. We can't just talk about victory. We can't just talk about prayer and expect God to do what he said. But if we're not living the way God has told us to live. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, listen, it's difficult. It's difficult to be in this world and not be part of it. And God doesn't want you to live a life of do's and don'ts. And listen, in the word of God, there are so many do's that if you just spend your time doing the do's, you'll be so, so busy doing the do's that you won't have time to do the don'ts or to worry about them. Because God, in God, there is so much to celebrate. There is so much that he does. So here's the thing about sin. Eventually, you know, it, initially it looks good. It looks fun. And initially it is fun. Sin is fun. But it leads to death. And what I'm saying is when, when, when we're looking at our lives and we're constantly questioning God, where's my breakthrough? What's going on? God is just telling us in this time and in this season, I need everybody to come up higher. And we look at the enemy and we want to blame the enemy for all the things that are in our path. But sometimes it's our own choices and we are standing in our way. And listen, compromising. Compromising isn't just about, about the sins, but it's also compromising in our thought patterns. I mean, how many times do we vacillate in our faith? And we compromise, well, you know, I don't know if he will, maybe he won't, I know he can. And yet, whose report do we believe? Guys are so quiet, but that's okay. But here's the thing. We've got to get to the root of the problem. And I think that one of the main roots of why people compromise is the fear of rejection of people. And sometimes we think that peer pressure is only for teenagers or for kids. But I will tell you, being an old lady at 47 years old, there are always, I'm talking about myself, I know everybody else here, we, you're all young. But here's the thing. We all suffer from peer pressure. Because deep down inside of us, there is this initial need that we want to be loved, and we want to be appreciated, and we want to um, be popular. Because let's face it, it doesn't feel good when people don't like you. Who likes to not be liked? Who likes to not be accepted? And, and again, this is not about, you know, you walk into a room and you are so righteous and holy that, you know, you, you can't be around anybody and you can go around and point everybody's sin out and do this and do that. Because let me tell you something. The moment you are somebody that points their finger at everybody else's sin, God will one day expose your sin. Because here's the thing. It comes down to humility. And when people can point figures and they can be judgmental and they can have a pharisaical spirit, that is nothing but pride. And if pride lives inside of you because God loves you, he's got he's, he's to he's take that out of you. He's got he's to do some surgery on your life and on my life when we have pride. And sometimes the pride even goes, well, I would never do that. Oh, don't ever say what you would never do because the very thing that you say you would never do is probably the very thing that you will do. That's why it's always safer to say, you know, when I see somebody doing something or something's off or somebody wants me to go ahead and, and go with them and, you know, uh, and agree with them, it's better off to say, you know what, there but by the grace of God, go I. And sometimes you have got to risk not being liked 
because you love God more. I can love you, but you know what? I love God more. I don't know about you, but I am so desperate to have everything that God wants me to have. You know, time is my friend, but it's, it's high time that I start coming into the things that God has for me. I, I'm seeing God doing a shift in my life. I, I'm, I'm seeing that God is starting to open up doors. I'm seeing God giving me favor. I mean, and it's just coming from the strangest places. And I'll tell you what, when I see God moving, I know Satan is going to move. So I have to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. And I have got to protect because here's the thing. Sometimes what we don't understand, you know, we do everything in our life to protect our investments. Okay? You know, where, where our money goes and what we do. And we, we, always, we always protect our investments. And yet what we don't understand is that God... And, and we also want to return on our investments, right? Nobody will ever invest something where they're not going to get a return. Okay, but let's flip it into the spiritual. God also made a financial investment into your life. What is that? It was the blood of his son, Jesus. And God is expecting a return on his investment. And when you think of all the things that God has invested in you, what God has given you, and listen, me, myself, I have been to hell and back. Everything I do, it has cost me everything. Since the time I was 14 years old and I gave my heart to the Lord, from that moment on, God has, has been blessing me. God has been keeping me. He has been teaching me. And I have gone, I've gone to hell and back. And God has put oil in me. Because that's what your trials and your tests do. They, they produce oil in your life. And my oil is precious to me. And because God put that investment in me, he took the time to walk me through things, to love me through things. He took the time to correct me in those, in those places where I was wrong so that I grow, that I can grow up and I can start doing and being what he's called me to be. There's an investment that he made on me. And for me, that's precious. And it's my responsibility to guard my oil. It's your, I mean, how important, how, what does it mean to you what God has placed inside of you? We protect our jewelry, we protect our money, we protect, we protect our, our, our material things. But honestly, do we protect the spirit? Or do we just, you know, I could do whatever I want because God knows me and God loves me and he forgives me. It's not so much about right and wrong as it is where is my relationship with God? How precious is he to me? That everything that he's given me, I want to protect it. I don't, I don't want to waste one drop of my oil. And I cannot be reckless with my oil. You remember the woman, the sinful woman. When she came and she anointed Jesus and she broke open her alabaster box. Everybody around had a fit. You know how many people you could have fed? You know what you could have done with that oil? And basically what Jesus says is she would have wasted it on the poor, but she did the best thing she could. She used it. She invested it on me. He was rebuking the disciples. Don't you understand what this oil is? Where is your heart? Talk about guarding your heart. Guard those things that God has done in your life. Savor what he did on the cross of Calvary. Savor the fact that, listen, nobody else might like you. Nobody else has your back. But he gave his life for you. Just so that he could bless you. So that he could save you. So that you would never be separated from him. Sometimes we just take our salvation and we take, 
We take what Jesus did for granted. I know that this isn't revelation and I know that this isn't deep, but you know what? If you started appreciating what God did in your life, for everything that he has brought you through. Yes, you've gone through some things that you didn't want to go through. But you know what? You're here today. And you and I, we don't look like what we've been through. And is he not worthy? Is he not worthy to allow him to have the return on his investment? That every time we put ourselves down, every time that we flirt with sin, every time that we compromise ourselves, what we're saying is, God, you didn't give enough to me. Are you hearing this? And I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this because there's something when, when you know, Janine, and Janine mentioned it at the woman's retreat because I started to pray because I got to tell you, like, I'm just sick and tired of seeing everybody sick and tired. I mean, let, let's just be real here. I mean, there has been storm after storm after storm. Everybody has gotten hit. And I, I and listen, you've got to know how near and dear you are to my heart for me to, to go through the week that I've been, and I am still here. I, I'm on my knees every day for you. I pray for you. And I've been asking God, please, God, what are the hindrances? Because God showed me. He told me, he says, Karen, you need to change how you're praying, and you need to ask me to reveal what the hindrances are and what is stopping the people. Because it's not that you don't pray. You don't pray the way you should. And I began to pray and say, God, what is blocking our prayers? Because the book of Daniel, in chapter 9, it said Daniel prayed. In chapter 10, the, the, the angel says, listen, God heard you the first time you prayed. He said, but there's a demonic spirit that came against you and was blocking. Because here's something that I learned. In everything in God, there is decency and order. Not every angel that is dispatched has the same assignment or the same capabilities. The same angel that is sent to bring you the blessing is not the same angel that fights for you. Okay? So, so here, and, and look in the book of Daniel, chapter 10, 9 and 10. Daniel prays the first time. And so the angel is dispatched. But in the chapter 10, it says, then finally, Gabriel. Gabriel was the one who fought. Because the angels do what they're told to do. They don't, see, this is where we can take a lesson. They just don't assume. The one angel had the assignment. He had the blessing in his hand. But God didn't tell and dispatch that angel to go and fight. God had to send Gabriel. He had to send another angel on another assignment to fight the demonic force so that it got, it got the demonic force out of the way and then the blessing came. So when you're praying, you've got to pray strategically. And when you're praying strategically, we, one of the other hindrances are when we pray, we are praying and we are listening to what we want to hear. And we always say, God's not talking to me. God, I can't hear God. God is speaking, but nine out of ten, you don't like what he's telling you. So you won't listen and you'll go to your arm of flesh. And any time that you lean to your flesh, there's going to be a hindrance. There's going to be a blockage. That's why the worst thing that you can do in your life is not be teachable. It's to be full of pride because God, what does God say about the proud? He says, I resist the proud. Why couldn't the young rich ruler, why couldn't he go to heaven? Why couldn't he get? Because God says, well, get rid of everything. Sell everything. And he didn't like that answer. He didn't. And, and what? why? Because if I don't have my money, then who am I? I've worked for all of this. Because he wasn't willing to do what God wanted him to do. <laughs> Is this making sense to you? Is it shedding some light on maybe, maybe why? Because listen, I want to tell you that there is nothing wrong with God. There's nothing wrong with God. 
God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. He's able to keep that which he committed. He's able to perform that which he's promised. So there's nothing wrong with God. So if there's nothing wrong with God and I'm not walking in what it is I need to walk in, then there might be a few things. One, it might be the timing. It just not, might not be God's timing. And if it's not God's timing, what do I do? I just keep walking and I just keep being faithful. You can't pull a Karen and get upset and say, you know what? I don't like the way my life is going, so now I'm going to go to the OBI and I'm going to decide to sit and, and destroy my life. Let my stupidity help you. And I'll put my own stuff out there. I don't need to preach about anybody else's stuff because I've been there, done that, and made those mistakes. So what I learn from God, I give to you freely. So don't pull a Karen. Don't try to step out in your flesh and get aggravated because God doesn't seem to do what he wants to do because maybe it's just out of God's time. Or maybe we're behaving and we're doing things that are blocking the spirit of God. Because if we love God, we keep his commandments. And God will also not give us something that we're not ready for. If we can't be faithful and trusted in small things and easy things, God cannot give us greater things. See, I fasted and I prayed and I went before the Lord and I was like, what's up? Because I, because I know everybody's saying, what's up? And I was saying, people are getting upset because I, I, I'm, I'm preaching faith. I'm preaching all this, but there, there's, there's a hold up. And God said to me, because my people sabotage themselves. Listen, the Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. So what I'm saying to you, because I love you, and this sounds like it, it's not condemnation, but if I didn't love you, if I didn't care, if I wasn't serious with God, I would just preach happy messages all the time. But I want to see you grow. I want to see you possess all that God has for you. So this might be tough, but it is tough love. But nevertheless, it is love. So let him who has an ear, let him hear. And many times what happens is because we fall under that peer pressure. We got to get delivered from people. We got to conform to God's image and not man's image. Nothing is going to fill me and satisfy me like the presence of God. I have a wonderful husband. I have a husband who pays attention to me. But as great as a man as he is, and you think, well, if I get married, I'm just going to be so blessed and I'll be fulfilled. No, you're not. No, you're not. I got ministry. I have a wonderful husband. I have three beautiful children. I'm grateful for my mom still being with me. But all of that put together does not satisfy me like being in the presence of my God. Because he is the source of my strength. That every blessing I have, it came from him. But the moment that I put anything, my children, my ministry, my mother, anything that comes before God, it's going to rob me of the blessing. I'm compromising something. It's easier to please, to, to please God than to please man. Because you know what? You can, you, let me tell you something. You can preach people happy and they will love you, but preach a sermon like this and you'd be amazed at how many people don't want to be your friend no more. And don't like what you're saying. I'm responsible. I have to preach the whole gospel. I can't be your friend. I got to be your pastor. I got to be a teacher of the word because why? There's a mandate on my life. And I want to help you. This is the stuff that God told me to tell you. Because when we, when, you know, when, 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 we, when we please God, or I'm sorry, when, when we please man, what happens? 
we lose our self-worth. We become a chameleon. We lose our identity. Because when you're pleasing man, you're not pleasing God, and therefore you have lost yourself. And sometimes God just reveals, listen, I, I'm, I'm going to say it. If you're hanging out with people, and I don't care how good of friends they are, if you're hanging out with people that are pulling you down and pulling you away from the things of God, get away from them. I'm not saying hate them. I'm not saying that. But your sphere of influence and listen, if you've, got, if you've got weak stuff, you know, when I was trying to lose weight, I noticed, I noticed something. I had eating buddies. I had, right? You, you have eating buddies. You have people that you just love to go out and have chicken wings with. I used to love to go to the ground round, and I used to love to eat chicken wings. You get like, you know, it was like bottomless pit of chicken wings, and you just sit there all night long and drink soda and chicken wings. And you see, when I wanted to lose the weight and God started doing something in my life, and I turned around and I started saying, I don't, I, I don't want to eat chicken wings anymore. Let's go do something different. That person didn't want to stop eating chicken wings. And eventually, I was either going to stay fat or I was, was going to get thin. And I had to get free. And eventually, that person walked out of my life. But here's the thing you got to look at. Sometimes we're afraid to let go. But if, if I wanted to be healthy, because I was killing myself, why do I want to hang out with somebody who wants to aid in my death? I want to be with somebody who will pull me up. I have very strong accountability in my life. The people that I have aligned myself with, Oh, let me tell you something. My bishop, he'll, he'll tell me a thing or two. He won't, he won't let me compromise because he sees the good in me. He sees the potential. He can see where the enemy will trip me up. And if he's got to pull me in his office and he's got to talk me and, and, and yell at me and do whatever he's got to do, then that's what he's got to do. Those are the kind of people I want to be with. I don't want to be with people that are going to separate me from my destiny, that are going to hurt me, that are going to encourage me to do things. Listen, we tell our kids all the time, stay away from that crowd. They're a bad influence. But we think because we're adults, we're strong enough to do that. And we're not. We're just big kids. And we're more dangerous than kids because we think we know it all because we've been through it all. Not. But here's the good news. When we struggle with something and when we slip and when we fall and we have a lapse in judgment, don't let a lapse become a collapse. Don't let a lapse become a collapse. Because if you let it become a collapse, then you've really given the enemy all the power over you. You know, the Bible says that a righteous man, how many times does he fall down? Seven times. And how many times does he get up? Seven. Everybody's going to make a mistake. Everybody's going to have a lapse in judgment. Everybody's going to lose their mind over something. Everybody. 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 Greek, Hebrew, black, Hebrew, everybody. Biblical languages. Everybody. After, you know, when, when, David, when David sinned with um, Bathsheba, he didn't, he didn't let that be the destruction of everything. He, you know, he lied. He tried to get out of it. He, you know, he shifted things. He, he, he did a lot of bad things. But in the end, he owned up to it. And he repented. And he said, I'm sorry. And he understands that today is a day of salvation. Don't allow, listen, it's like going on a diet. And I always use this because it's so true. 
you're good, you're good, you're doing all this stuff, and you're eating right, and then all of a sudden one day you slip up, and you have that Oreo, and then that Oreo, it leads to a sleeve of Oreos, then it leads to the whole, well, if I ate the sleeve of Oreos, I'm, I might as well just eat the second one, and well, you know what, I'll eat the third, and I'll eat the fourth, and then a whole, you know, a lapse becomes a collapse, and then all of a sudden, you can't get back on track again. And the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day where you can get it right. You know, just because people have a lapse in judgment and sin doesn't make them of the devil. But we've got to start examining our lives. We've got to start looking at our lives and, and, um, and understand that God has invested so much in us. And, and we've been in this place too long I'm like Lord this season's got to come to an end so because I'm desperate to get out of this season God show me the things in my life that gotta go let it be you know prepare me prepare prepare me that I could be a living sanctuary for you that I live a life that's pure and holy and you know I know that people are not talking about this today People are talking about prosperity. People are talking about miracles and signs and wonders and, and healings and happy things. Nobody's talking about dying to flesh. But just because nobody's talking about it doesn't make it that it's not true. We still got to preach the blood. If it makes people uncomfortable, it's supposed to make you uncomfortable. You're not supposed to just sit in church and be constantly happy. Whom God loves, he chastens. Every one of us, listen, we have to learn how to die daily. We have to learn how, how, how you know, God, every day, because I love you. I want more of you in my life. So, Lord, I surrender all, whatever it is. Whatever I've got going on in my life that needs to die, give me the strength to give it up. Give me the strength to walk away from it. And, you know, sometimes, you know, because we're lonely and we have our friends and we want to be Christians and sometimes we don't know how to get away from toxic relationships. Listen, don't say the distance. Just do the distance. Sometimes you just, you just got you to separate yourself. You, you got you to take an inventory of the relationships that you have around you. You got to hang out with people that are going to pull you up. And in a loving way, you know, hey, Karen, you can't do that. I thank God for Janine. Janine's sweet and nice, but she's tough. My husband, he's like, they're, you know, my kids, they're tough. They're, didn't, you, didn't you say that, Mom? Charlie will, will, will brag incessantly that, that he is the trying and testing of my faith. And I have failed many tests, but I have overcome. And so I don't, I don't say these things to condemn you. Because in Christ, there is no condemnation, okay? We're all going to sin. We're all, you know, we, we, we all flirt with sin. And listen, I am not by any means telling you to go psycho Christian and throw your televisions out and throw your Christmas trees out like, like we did in the 70s. People know what I'm talking about, okay? I'm not saying that. I, but but I am saying that if all you have with somebody is eating chicken wings and you can't do anything with that person other than eat chicken wings, well, then maybe that relationship doesn't have enough substance. Because if, if, if the relate, I mean, Janine and I, we could always find something to talk about, whether, whether or not we're eating, we're not eating. We don't, we, and, and we're not friends just because of ministry. But yet I could tell because one thing that's good between us is that we pull each other up. That we can sit there and when, when somebody's going through something, 
we can let that person, you know, vent. You know, Janine's Janine's famous, like, you know, because she knows the preacher in me. When I hear stuff, I automatically go into, like, minister mode. And sometimes I'm not in friend mode because a minister will give you the answer. But a friend just wants to listen. And I can't, I, what's in you comes out of you. And I don't like to see people in a place. But she'll, she comes with a warning label. With the Karen friend, please come out. And she'll say, I don't need you to minister. I just need you to listen. And I will sit there and I will bite my tongue. And I'll be that friend. And once she gets it all out, and I'll look and I'll, and I'll, is it a good time to speak? No? Okay. And I'll, and I'll sometimes, and is it true or not? But I'll wait like a week or so. Really hard for me. Okay. My tongue is bleeding by that time. And I'll say, um, I know the other day you, you wanted me to listen, but can I have permission to speak? And I'll be able to say, you know, I know that you were on a rant, and I know that you had to get this stuff out. I said, but you said a couple of things, and I just want to verify that it was just venting, or is it a real founded belief? And she does the same thing for me, except she's a much better listener. And sometimes I'll say, don't you have anything to say? And she'll say no, because I know if I give you about another 15 minutes, you'll start turning around talking yourself out of it. But we don't let ourselves stay in a place that could hurt us. We don't do that. And that's the kind of friends that you need. You need people that are going to pull you up and not feed your sin. And, and, and Because listen, whatever, whatever you feed is going to live. So if you're going to feed your flesh, your flesh will live. If you starve your flesh, your flesh will die and your spirit will live. And God doesn't want you to be the kind of people that you can't talk about anything, you can't go to a game, you can't go to a movie, you, you can't have fun, but you can have fun in Him. And whatsoever things are pure and lovely and of good report, and if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, you start to dwell and think on those things. Why? If God put it in his word, he put it in his word because it's good for us. You know, sometimes you get people that are so negative. It's, it's not even, listen, it's not even anything that they're doing, you know, eating or drinking or whatever it is. Sometimes people are just so negative. And they will wear on you and they will pull you down. You can pray for them. But you've got to do some distance. Because whatever you hang around with, whatever your sphere of influence is, that's what you're going to become. Larry Goss, he was, you know, he passed away this year. But he was, I mean, the master of orchestration. I mean, he, he was such, he was such a tiny man. But his music and his character were, were so big and he used to say to me you know, when we were in the studio he's you know I said man Larry I said you, you're just so awesome and he goes you want to know my secret I says yeah he says I surround myself with musicians that are better than me he says I sit them down and I, and I saw the way he worked because, you know, I'm from New York, and they were in Nashville, and New York was like, okay, time is money, let's go. And he would pull them in, and, like, for 45 minutes, they would talk. And I would get frustrated because I'm like, uh, people, I don't, I don't have, like, all of this kind of money for you to be sitting around and talking. But what he was doing was they would start to talk, and he would be like, well, what do you think, and what do you think? And all of a sudden, they added so much more than what he had. And he says, they will make me look good. They aspire me to write better. They bring out the good stuff. He says, I surround myself with people that are more talented. And he says, a lot of times people, they'll surround themselves with people that are less than they are because they want to make themselves look good. But if you do that, you don't grow. You don't grow. You need people. Everybody needs a Paul in their life. 
Everybody needs somebody to look up to that's going to pull them up to where they are. And you, the people that are the Timothys in your life, the younger ones, you can minister to them, but not necessarily hang with them. There's levels of maturity. Timothys are, are, are you know, you mentor them, but then there are Barnabases in your life that you work with that are on your level. But you need, you, everybody needs a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. You need somebody below you. You need somebody parallel to you. And then you need somebody above you. Because if you don't have somebody above you, you're either going to stay where you are or you're going to go down. And when God speaks, he speaks to your future. God is only speaking for you to go up. Amen? So I just want to encourage you that, you know, and this is kind of like the last um, really tough message. And it'll, it'll get a little bit happier and a little bit easier. But we've got to look at these things. Because how many really want everything that God wants for them? Okay? I, 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 I'm tired. Like, I, I don't have any more years. Like, I'm like, God, before I don't have my own teeth. You know what I mean? <laughs> Please, can we, bring this, can we bring this to pass? And I'm just determined that God... You know, every, every, I guess maybe I'm just getting older and I'm just starting to, to realize in my life what God has really done for me. You know, like I, I thank God that God has really made me a minister that is truly anointed for multicultural settings. That I mean going from my own personal retreat to this singles retreat and then, and then to Bethany, I mean, I, I can be all things to all men. And I realize that not everybody can do that. And I'm starting to realize what God did in my life and the blessings that he's given me. And if it's not just all the things that he's given me, but what he did for me at Calvary. Because maybe because you're getting older and every day you're getting closer to seeing him. I don't know. And I don't say that in a negative way. But it just makes me realize, because every day I fall more and more in love with him, and I realize if, if he didn't do anything but give me life and save me, that I'm not going to hell, I don't need anything else. And I'm just determined that I so want, before I go and, 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 I, and I stand before him one day, I just so want to hear, well done. I want to hear that my father is pleased with me, that I did everything that, that I could. And I'll tell you something, being in, in the presence of God, I mean, as, as exhausted as I am right now, these past two weeks between the retreat and, 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 and the, the singles conference and, and being in the presence of God, like God has allowed me to do what he's called me to do. Like I, I'm, I'm walking in it and I'm, and I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. And I realize that because to whom much is given, much is required. And I got to be the watchman on the wall for my own life. For my own life. I can't be reckless with the stuff that's in my life. Because it costs me everything in my life, but it costs Christ everything. It costs Christ's life for me to have the blessings, to have the peace. The fact that I don't look like what I went through. And God's worthy. He's worthy of that kind of praise. I'm crazy about him and he's crazy about me. And he's crazy about you. Are you crazy about him? Because if you are, I tell you something, it's going to be an awesome, awesome walk that you have with him. And don't be afraid for him to call you out on some of the things that, that, that you're thinking, that you're doing, if you've got wrong mindsets. I mean, some of us have lived with mindsets that, you know, 30, 40 years, and, and we're afraid to let go of some stuff. But if you don't let go of that stuff and surrender it to God, you'll never get the new stuff. There's only so much you can hold in your hands. One of the hardest things about, about this conference that I've got, I've got to have so many clothes and bags and this and that. And it was so difficult because I didn't have my husband with me. I didn't have anybody to help me. And I was juggling. I was juggling all these bags and all my luggage all by myself. And God says, I don't want you handling all that by yourself, spiritually. Let me handle it. 
Get rid of the stuff that doesn't belong there. David said, take the iniquity out of my heart. Take even the desire to sin. Because I will tell you this, and then I'm really going to close. <laughs> I'm Pentecostal at heart. We've got to have three or four closings. Um, what was I going to say? You just don't want anything, anything to come in between you and God. Because to walk with God is such a privilege. I mean, I don't, I don't think that we, we really see it like that. But do you know the privilege that we have to serve the Lord? To be loved by Him. And don't be afraid for Him to touch that stuff in your heart. Because whom God loves, God chastens. If God is convicting you and God is, you know, kind of getting in there and touching stuff, just, just let him touch you. Just, just surrender all to him and watch what he does in your life. Because whatever you think you're holding on to is nothing compared to what he wants to fill you with once you release it. Amen? Amen. God bless you tonight. Um, please excuse me, but I'm going to dress and then I'm going to take off because um, I got to get back to I got to get back to Jersey tonight because I got to uh, preach at 8:30 in the morning. Like they couldn't put me on at 11 o'clock; they had to do it at 8:30. But whatever, I'm not going to complain. Kathy's going to come by and take up the offering. Um, this goes between uh, Karen Orlando Ministries and Samantha's Little Bit of Heaven Ministries so that we can keep going and keep growing. I love you all. I appreciate all of you. Um, I know that these have been two tough messages, but without the tough stuff, we're not going to grow. And I don't want to stay the same. I want to just keep going and growing and growing and growing and growing. Amen.